You guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones, phone. right? You can play your tablet too. <laughs> Grim Dawn is an action RPG released in 2016 by Crate Entertainment for the PC and Xbox One. Right, and I don't even know what it means to be on a nuclear sub. The game is widely regarded as one of the best action RPGs following in the footsteps of games like Diablo 2, and still holds up against its recently released competition. It's had two expansions and a third one is in the works, which absolutely looks right up my alley because I'm a dog person, look at him, look at that good boy. So why review it a good 8 years later? Well, lord knows I have the time, and they just recently put out a massive patch, which changed and added a load of stuff. Now, this isn't a normal late review because I am playing with both expansions installed, Ashes of Malmoth and Forgotten Gods, and the game is getting updates and another expansion, so I'm just doing it as a blanket 2024 review. The game features multiplayer, but I am reviewing in single player predominantly. For spoilers, it's open season baby, I'm going to talk about whatever I want, but I won't go out of my way to spoil the whole story. Okay, let's start with the gameplay. First up, character creation. Ooh, difficult choice. This is going to hold me up for a while. Okay, we're done. That's it. Grim Dawn is a game where the character customization comes through build choices, devotion talents, and your sense of fashion. Don't be put off by this. You're up in space looking down at your character the entire time. You pick no starting class or weapons, you simply press start and go. At this point we can't pick any difficulty other than normal, but I can pick veteran mode to increase the challenge. This provides an experience gain boost and can be toggled on and off at any time from the main menu. The game begins with this wonderfully stylistic cinematic of a village burning. Three figures talk over a man kneeling in the dirt, a green glow emanating from his body. He is possessed by an ethereal, non-corporeal invaders from another realm. He says the time of humanity is over and that his kind have already won. Big talk for a guy kneeling in the dirt and it doesn't really amount to much because they throw a noose around his neck and string him up. As the body is about to die, the entity flees, and the captain decides to try and save what's left of the human being, now free from the ethereal possession. That poor bastard is you. Still drawing breath, I see. Welcome to Cairn, a post-apocalyptic fantasy world populated by barbarians, warlocks, and the remnants of the Great Empire of Man. Such devastation! In Cairn, humans have been decimated by an event known as the Grim Dawn, the coming of ethereal invaders. I begin by getting a pep talk from the local hangman, always a good start. I'd have left you to hang, but uh, the captain had other plans. Before seeking out Captain Bourbon. I suspect he's got a drinking problem, but I owe the man for saving my life, so when he tells me the locals need help, I may as well pitch in. He wants me to wipe out the local undead and their reanimated dad. And so off I go into the wet, muddy landscape. It's like stepping into a wonderful fantasy land and the UK at the same time. You navigate the world in Grim Dawn by either clicking on where you want your character to run and letting them run there, or by holding down your mouse and steering your character. Sort of like steering a ship across the briny, although thankfully not a quadruple A rated ship but one that's actually watertight. Attacking enemies is, at this point, as simple as clicking on them and holding down mouse 1. You can give whoever your cursor is over a beatdown, or if you want to get fancy, hold shift and left click. This is useful for ranged attacking as it will allow you to pivot in place, remaining stationary but attacking in the direction of your mouse cursor. Pathfinding is very good, although it struggles with staircases on rare occasions. However, sometimes it is good enough to navigate an absurd distance from a single click. My character begins the game with a basic weapon and shield, but this is just literal scrap to bonk with. In fact, many of the early weapons are made from scrap materials, a lovely way to enrich that post-apocalyptic feeling. I also test out the dodge roll, which is called Evade. Dodge rolling wasn't in Grim Dawn initially, in fact it was only just added in the patch the day before I started playing. But it's probably one of the best implementations of a dodge I've seen. You hit space and you slide wherever your mouse is aiming. There's no delay and evading will make use of invulnerability frames or iframes. These are frames of animation during which your character takes no damage. This feels short enough not to offer any supreme or game breaking advantage, yet makes up for it by the sheer distance covered by the evade. And it's after playing for a while I realised why it's called evade and not dodge. It's designed to get you out of the way of damage, rather than rely on spamming dodges for iframes. There's a short cooldown, short enough to make the skill useful in combat, long enough so you can't just cheese it and roll panda style until the enemy gets bored. 
While I'm playing, the game is being explained to me via pop-up tutorial boxes. I'm never a fan of these, however I can't grumble because the gameplay is intuitive enough to pick up without ever reading a tutorial, and the other systems are largely self-explanatory. These tutorials are for true first-timers, and they explain the game well. Good for new players and unobtrusive for seasoned players. Seasoned? It's a horrible thing to say to a man. Perhaps the most obvious feature of Grim Dawn versus other ARPGs is the camera can be rotated entirely. Quickly I find a better weapon, a two-handed greatsword with lightning damage, it even has an electric swish when I swing it, now we're talking, I'm gonna have a lot of fun with this, I'm positive. But I've also found a fucking gun. Anyway, I started blasting. Bah! Here is where Grim Dawn straight up excels over other class restrictive ARPGs. There is nothing stopping me from using my sword and that gun. I can equip and blow zombies away, in fact there's a weapon swapping system that allows me to switch between two weapon sets. While exploring I find a wounded man in a cabin who says we're all going to die. Personally I plan to live forever but I won't lie this guy is in for less disappointment. He claims he was separated from his group and can't get back to Devil's Crossing, that's the settlement where they tried to hang me. In a fantastic touch there are two options here now. I can tell him the way is clear, and it is because I fully explored every corner of the map like a sniffer dog, or I could just open a rift gate for you. Now, rift gates are the fast travel system in Grim Dawn. As you progress across the overland you'll find rift gates that act as both milestones and portals. You can teleport to any rift gate you like at any time by summoning your personal rift gate. This is like a scroll of town portal except it goes absolutely everywhere. In the world of Grim Dawn, rift gates are where the ethereal invaders pour through, so this is a wonderful way to weave fast travel into the narrative as well as imply a latent connection between our character and the ethereal who possessed us. I decide to just teleport him to safety and he disappears into a rift gate. Best escort quest ever, guy puts up no fuss and he's happy being teleported. This is what we call a site to site transport. Some rift gates are unlocked simply by reaching them, but there are also gates where you must defeat the invading mobs before the rift gate will open. The portable rift gate is very useful to drop as a save point before a challenging fight, or if you've just walked a really long way. This is because there is no manual saving per se. Your quest progress, character, reputation and world progress are saved automatically. When you exit the game you will always be in the nearest town hub upon your next start. The game is designed this way as the world repopulates with more cannon fodder, freshly generated heroes and respawned bosses ready for you to farm shiny loot. Try to get into the habit of putting down your personal rift gate every now and then during a session. Unlike me, I've got enough experience to level up and I decide to pursue the necromancer mastery. I love necromancers, I played a lich in Pathfinder, reanimation fascinates me and I think Arthas did nothing wrong. There are a wide variety of masteries available to us here, some base game, some added by the expansions. Let me just break down the options for necromancer and the general way masteries work. In Grim Dawn you get points to assign to skills and there are different chains of progression moving from left to right. To get the rightmost skill in a chain you obviously first need to unlock the earlier skill, but you don't need to max out that earlier tier of the chain, which is very important. You can unlock a top tier ability with as little as one point spent earlier in the chain. However, to unlock that tier of skills to begin with, you need to increase your mastery level, and that is on the mastery bar at the bottom. The more points I spend on that, the more tiers of skills I unlock. Leveling up the mastery bar also provides class specific stat boosts. Soldiers gain more physique than Arch Arcanists, but Arcanists gain more spirit, etc. For my first ability I go with Reaping Strike, a passive ability that will affect all default weapon attacks. This skill will give my weapon attacks a damage boost and leech health to me. It only has a 12% chance to proc, proc being shorthand for something that triggers under specific circumstances. But this is on every single default weapon attack I do. Now I like this for multiple reasons. Button bloat is something I dislike in any RPG and it is often what pushes the design into relying on just one or two skills, which I also dislike. I like to be a balanced toolkit of different abilities and core skills. Having passive abilities like this that fire just by smacking people about is great. What's even better is this is on every default weapon attack. I know I said this and why is this such a big deal? There is nothing stopping me from taking out that gun and being a death knight with a rifle. See how some of my shots here are fired with a bloody mist effect? That's reaping strike. This is the sort of design choice that I'll see again and again in Grim Dawn as I progress. Flexibility. 
The Necromancer can also call upon Skeleton Entourage. I'm always dubious about pets in ARPGs as they can trivialise the experience, but I found this wasn't the case here at all. Although the option to go fully into a pet build is there, with very strong summons, for now I just have them out for company. Lastly, I get a vampiric suck that allows me to leech off enemies just by holding down the ability. This is so cool, my character does the force choke move and red vitae drains out from the enemies. It's a little weak, but it's early days. Don't worry, I will be trying out other classes later. In fact, I will try to dot in some footage of other classes to keep things interesting to watch. Mas masteries, not classes. You also gain attribute points when you level up, and these seem simple enough. Physique is how much of a chad you are, affecting your health pool, survivability, and lets you equip heavier armor. Cunning also affects your survivability by helping you kill things faster, giving you more damage with melee and ranged attacks, as well as hit chance, amongst other things. Cunning is required to wield ranged weapons and some melee weapons as well, so switching between a melee and ranged weapon may not always be an option. Spirit is for the Gandalf types. It allows you to wield greater magic weapons and increases your energy pool. I venture into Burial Hill and full disclosure, I fought this guy before. I did some testing on normal before the patch and it wasn't a hard fight by any stretch of the imagination. But now I'm playing on veteran. And holy shit, you have to be awake on veteran. As a new player, this was a challenge and I got wrecked. The boss constantly reanimates zombies that throw toxic balls that create puddles of damage over time. The boss himself has a lot of health, but it doesn't feel like a sponge because it's the mechanics and my character missing that are keeping him healthy. I make plenty of use of the evade skill and my health potions. Despite my best impression of a dancer, I get clapped and it's all over for me. And I love it. I always appreciate it when a game doesn't feel the need to bump up my ego and is instead happy to put me down right from the start. It's not a humiliation kink, I just like some challenge. When you die, you lose experience, but you can get most of that back by running to your death point. After failing at the main entrance to the cave, I decide to take the necromancer's back door and encounter more resistance, but this time it's manageable. Right off the bat, Grimdawn succeeds in creating a challenging encounter that is capable of killing me but also always keeps victory in sight. With these zombies ended, I level up and unlock some new skills. I transform my blood suck into a frost suck, which not only slows enemies, but has a visually distinct look to it. Visual feedback for your build is something you'll see throughout the game. I also unlock this fucking awesome bone wave attack that is absolutely the area of effect damage I needed. Okay, time to go back and face the reanimator. And this time, even though it's still challenging, I know I can beat it, I can keep the adds under control with AoE, and I can keep my skeletons up so there's a little extra damage even though I'm missing so much with my sword. I can't hit for shit. Let me tell you, it was so satisfying to beat that first boss. Further in the cave, I find a shrine. Shrines are ancient sites that have gone neglected due to the apocalypse, but they can be cleansed with various components you'll have to either find or craft. There are also corrupted shrines, and there's no excuse for these, they're just fucking filthy. They don't want your petty charity, they want you to slay all the monsters inside them so they can be clean. I just wanna be pure. Sort of like a Stonehenge detox. Whatever type of shrine they are, once they're clean, you gain a devotion point. These are used in the devotion system and now, oh, okay. Oh fucking hell, not again. Okay, this is where you can really start to craft a character build. For now, I pop a point into the health boosting star and that unlocks a whole swath of constellations for future use. I'm going to talk more about the devotion system later, don't worry. Before that though, I want to skip ahead to talk about what happens when you hit level 10, because in my opinion, it is the feature that makes Grimdawn's class progression the creme de la creme of ARPGs, dual classing. It's simple but absolutely effective in allowing so much character building. And now we're going to delve into the other classes. Masteries. First up, we have Soldier. I picked this one to turn my Necromancer into a Death Knight. This is your man at arms, melee focused class. Skills revolve around survivability, mitigation, and melee damage but also buffing allies and controlling enemies. For instance, this force wave ability sends out a shockwave in front of me. It doesn't deal anywhere near as much damage as Bone Harvest, but it stuns enemies. This makes for a great combo with Harvest. Cadence is a default attack ability native to the soldier. Every third strike with Cadence will inflict massive damage with a very satisfying bonk. I can use this to replace my standard default left click attack. And since Cadence is classified as a default attack, 
all those juicy Necromancer abilities will stack on top of it as well. This isn't just happening because Necromancer and Soldier go well together, I mean they do, but this is because the mastery system in Grim Dawn is designed to let the player experiment with stacking skills and building very different characters. For example, the pet summons from a Necromancer coupled with the powerful self buffs would go very well with the Arcanist to allow for a strong magic character with a wall of pets to protect them. Much later, I get access to the soldier's war cry ability. This is it, we're about to channel the raw power of a military veteran through their throat into a shout capable of reducing enemy health pools by 33%. Brace yourselves. Okay, well, I guess the sound effect is meant to be heard over and over, so it had to be kept tame. It's a good idea. Not quite the roar I was imagining. But this is the tip of the iceberg. We've got Molotov cocktail hurling demo men who have zero regard for the fire code. Be cool about fire. The Arcanist is your academic type. To demonstrate just how powerful they are, they harness ethereal magic, the power of the elements, and correct grammar, even though nobody cares. The Arcanist does have my favorite ability in the entire game. Albrecht's Ether Ray, a pure beam of disintegration. Look at this, it's so satisfying, it's unreal. There's only one thing that puts out that much power. The main deflector dish. It's the only component of the Enterprise designed to channel that much power at controlled frequencies. Curse slinging occultists backed up by ravens and demon dogs who have their powers on loan from the witch gods. Dual wielding night blades who favor stealth and finesse over brute force. Shamans that punch so hard fucking lightning cracks from the sky. Ashes of Malmoth not only adds the Necromancer, but also the Inquisitor. Agents of Order who wield magic relics at the behest of the Emperor to seek out heresy wherever it may hide, before unloading dual pistols into its face. Finally, the Paladin main, but a good one. Added in Forgotten Gods, Oath Keepers call upon divine powers to smite evil. Not only do they get an angel buddy, not only do they become a merry-go-round of divine judgment, they get a Captain America shield toss, which for me is an essential piece of Paladin kit. I don't care how silly it is, just listen to this noise. That's the sound of forgiveness hitting the body. You know what, you're mostly going to see my Death Knight gameplay, so here's a little bit of uninterrupted pure joy from the Oath Keeper. But I continue with my very edgy Death Knight. I make it back to report my success and Bourbon the Lush is very pleased. Thanks to your efforts, we may yet hold out here a little longer. He asks me to speak to Barnabas and lets me into the Devil's Crossing settlement. It's here I realise that the big building is Burwich Prison. This makes so much sense, because a prison would double as a defensive position. There's a logical explanation why this large structure is relatively intact, while everything else is trashed. And this will be expanded upon by other parts of the story. Once I get inside, the man I sent here via Riftgate is safe and sound. He gives me some scrap metal, which is exactly what Barnabas needs to fix the water pump. That was the last piece I needed, because Grim Dawn doesn't waste the player's time by needing you to pick up the quest first. Pieces of scrap have been dropping even before I knew I needed it. That's good game design. Now, while scrap is a crafting material, and drops throughout the game anyway, this happens with quest items as well. The funniest instance of this occurs in Act 5, when after turning in a main quest, I am able to complete four follow-up quests instantly without ever leaving the camp. Why yes, I can collect those spell reagents. From my fanny pack. That we require... Do you have the material? Perfect. These are just what we need. Of course, I'll be happy to go speak with the Matron of the Coven. Kill a traitor witch? That bitch dead! I took care of her this morning. The water pump is fixed, but there's a problem. The water is rancid because the cave is rife with Slyph. Slyph are Grim Dawn's version of Naga, Vipers, Snake Women, and of course, one tea. Time to head down there and change the filter. But while I'm down here in the Slyph stink pit, I'm going to talk about your two potions, the Tonic of Mending and the Elixir of Spirit, or in layman's terms, health and energy. Previously in Grim Dawn, you would collect health and energy potions and stack them in your inventory. It was almost impossible to run out of these potions. In the latest patch, they've just been changed to abilities on a cooldown, making them infinite consumables, effectively cutting out the looting and hoarding aspect of potions. I've seen mixed feedback. Some people love this, some people hate this. I love it. If potions are so numerous that I never run out, just make it so I never run out. Having to pick them up and watch them stack in my bags is not doing anything for me. I picked up every bottle of Quantum and Sarsaparilla to store it in a fridge. I hoard, 
useless items. I get that collection aspect. I've had word from a settlement asking for help. But this is not the case here, it's just consumable efficiency. Both health and energy potions scale to character health and energy pools, meaning you'll never find yourself short, although they're not entirely instant. There's an initial restore, followed by a very quick restoration effect that pushes your health or energy up fast. It's fast enough to make potion timing essential, but slow enough to mean they're not get out of jail free cards. There is talk of potion customization in the future, however, that is for now a gleam in that good doggo's eye. All this talk of potions has caused me to forget to keep an eye on my own health. This is user error here, I was having so much fun, I genuinely didn't realise I was about to die. And these spiders had a nasty poison attack. Enemies will inflict various statuses upon you, such as poison. Here I am getting my ass handed to me by a toxic green hedgehog. How many times do you get to say that? Just look at how many debuffs are applied here. They're all short duration, but this happens frequently in Grim Dawn. Your basic bitch enemies will often inflict a single debuff. A minor poison from a spider is predictably poisonous, but acid from those junkyard insects? That reduces your weapon damage. Fighting the bad kind of hot demons with sharp claws, now you're bleeding and on fire. Separately, these don't hurt so much, but as more and more enemies inflict increasingly painful debuffs at the same time, it starts to become a danger. Bosses typically inflict multiple debuffs at the same time, playing on multiple weaknesses or resistances. As a melee character, I found the most devastating debuff for me was being rooted. It was almost always a death sentence. The enemy's ability to inflict a wide variety of status effects on top of straight damage is what encourages you to evade and to increase your resistances through equipment and character builds. More on resistances later. Also, I later encountered this hedgehog's orange brother. It's here I realised why I was taking so much fucking damage. I was standing in toxic waste. As if the green clouds weren't enough of a dead giveaway, I had to get knee deep in it after the fight just to double check where the damage was coming from. This is a good time to mention I discovered pretty late into my normal playthrough that you can turn floating health bars off, leaving just the health bar of your current target at the top of the screen. I want to rewind a bit now, back to when I talked about how I changed my force choke into a frost choke. That was just one of the many modifier skills in the game. Modifier skills are usually single skill point dumps that change one of your abilities. In the case of Drain Essence, that added a slow and changed the damage type from ether to cold. Remember Force Wave. It can be changed from a stun with a short cooldown to a spammable cheek slapping AoE attack. Cadence can have an increasing percentage of its damage converted from physical into elemental. These are just the tip of the iceberg. I've got a modifier skill for Bone Harvest, that's the awesome Bone Wave ability. If I take Harvester of Death, it reduces the size of the Bone Cone by 3 meters, but ups the damage by 20%, a significant increase for a trade-off. However, it also converts all of the damage done by that ability from base physical to cold damage, and adds a requirement to be using a two-handed sword. This is another great aspect of the skill system, because the system allows such flexibility with your playstyle, yet there are key points that allow you to specialise your character at that cost of flexibility, but with the payoff of character flavour and focus. I'm already using a two-handed sword, so this may seem like a no-brainer, but what if I want to deal physical damage instead of frost? And now when I switch to the ranged weapon, I can no longer use my bone harvest. This is a trade-off I'm going to experiment with to see if I like it. And if I don't like it, I can change it. Because you can just undo any build choices by talking to the spirit guide, paying iron bits, that's money in Grim Dawn, to reverse your skill choices. But be warned, there is no confirmation for doing this. I was demonstrating here how easy it is to respec your skills without realising I actually paid to remove everything I know like a dumbass. So yeah, it's so easy you can do this by accident. Respecing devotion points costs iron bits and ether crystals. So that is more of a commitment, but not massively, because by the end of my normal playthrough, I had enough crystal to become an associate at Los Palos Hermanos. It can be difficult to remain composed when a customer is disrespectful. There are some quests in Act 5 onwards that will give you tonics of reshaping and clarity. The first one will allow you to reset all your attributes, and the second will allow you to reset all your devotion points. These are for when you need to erase some big mistakes you made and start over, and there's no better eraser than nondescript bottles of liquid. 
It's worth mentioning you will need Ashes of Malmuth to access these quests, but these tonics also drop from Nemesis creatures. What's a Nemesis creature? I'll get to it later, there's a lot, there's so much. I tell old Barnabas that the Sliffs are extinct and he rewards me with a rucksack, which is great. I appreciate an inventory increase that isn't tied to the game's currency, but instead a quest reward. You'll find additional inventory upgrades as you complete quests. I can't carry anymore. My inventory is full. I'm a hoarder and love to vendor as much as I can, so a large inventory paired with the ability to pop back and forth to a vendor, oh man, I had a lot of fun just making bits. Although I really would like a suck option, please, Crate. Let me just hoover all this up like a black hole. Oh, there is a loot filter that will let you filter the loot that you see on the floor, and the rest of it will just be invisible. However, I didn't touch that because I wanted to gauge how much stuff actually dropped. A lot is the answer. You can set a key binding to hide all item drops and toggle it back on so you can see them again. Great for combat. It's worth mentioning that there is an auto sort button for every inventory screen in the game that can cycle through your preferred layout. Its primary function is just to Tetris items into a neat pile, but every inventory system needs this. I don't care what the excuse or reasoning is, if you haven't got a button that does this, you're wasting my time. Time I'd rather spend boning. Clinky Drinky Bourbon sends me north to take on more ethereals, and while up there I find some optional bosses and enemy heroes to tackle, including this big sliff shaman. He drops some epic loot for me, and unfortunately it's mostly useful for other classes. I do get a belt that increases my pet damage, but notice the plus two summon Briarthorn. That's specific to the shaman class. Eh, it's a shame because my next character would really appreciate this loot. If only I could give this gear to my other character. Got something you need stashed? Oh wow, Carlisle the Smuggler will do just that. If you go up to him, you'll see he functions as a banker. However, just tapping the purple button will switch from stash to transfer mode. Anything placed in a transfer tab can be withdrawn by any of your characters. You can even expand the storage with more storage tabs. Apparently in this game, they do have the technology. Expanding your storage costs increasing amounts of iron bits. Obviously the transfer stashes only need to be purchased once between all your characters. In a cave, I find some convicts who were no doubt kicked out of the prison. I finish the job by kicking them out of their lives and notice there are some hostages in the back of the cave. With the convicts dead, I offer to open these folks a rift gate, but they refuse, saying they should head back to their own group. I mean, if you really want to trudge through swamp land infested with snake people and venom porcupines, be my fucking guest. But I learn they belong to a faction called the Rovers. They don't want to take the Riftgate back to Devil's Crossing because it isn't their base. The apocalypse has shaped civilization into different pockets of humanity, and it's here we learn about factions. Your street cred is a big part of Grim Dawn, and you'll need to earn the respect of the factions before they consider you welcome. Different areas will have different groups of people, all wanting something from you, because the most realistic part of any fantasy world is that nobody wants to do it themselves. The Schemer's web demands my utmost attention. You're fucking full of shit, you know that? However, if you do their little jobs, they'll like you more. If you do enough, they'll like you enough to sell you shiny things. Trinkets, armor, recipes you can get nowhere else. Despite single-handedly taking care of the undead problem and, oh, I don't know, making sure they have water to drink, the people of Devil's Crossing merely tolerate me. Tolerated. Bloody cheek. You can view your reputation at any time in the Factions window. You'll be able to see not only your current progress, but hints at future unlocks. It says here when I reach Honoured with Devil's Crossing, I'll also unlock a new dungeon to explore. That is fantastic. That's not just an incentive to make friends for nice clothes, but to have more adventures as well. You'll also notice there are red reputations. Alienating groups of people is also a mechanic in this game. These are the enemy factions, and if you think you can cut a swath through hordes of them with no repercussions, I have news for you. The more hated you become with the enemies, the more of them will spawn. Eventually, more heroes will spawn. Those are the mini-boss type enemies. Finally, nemesis enemies will spawn. These are the ultimate representatives of these factions. They're here to shut you the fuck down, unless you can kill them and take their loot. Even the regular beasts of the world have a reputation bar and will spread news about your martial skill. 
So this dog I kill? Yeah, well I didn't know it, but his cousin Larry the boar told Carla the wasp, who told Vivi the wendigo, so, so now she knows, and this didn't stop with the wendigo. Someone got on the phone to the griffins a continent over. So now the whole fucking animal kingdom knows I'm the one that put the hit out on that dog. The natural world is out to get me. This has to be the only game where mother nature herself says, I'll take care of it. And if they think I'm going down for this dog, they're barking up the wrong tree. Back to factions. The delightful farming community of Homestead is the second hub you'll reach around Act 3, and it highlights why I love reputation in this game. They're farmers who have a perpetual pest problem. They have quests to deal with these insects, but just killing the bugs in general raises your rep, meaning you become friends with them just by doing your part. This is actually a great quest as well, plunging into the hive, wading through strange insects and eggs to exterminate the queen. I was worried that reputation grinding would be extremely monotonous, but it's not, and I ended up raising my rep with factions purely by playing the game and killing monsters. My joke about the animals cancelling me worldwide wasn't just a joke. Factions aren't always local. They're still pleased back in Homestead when you kill a beast enemy on the other side of the world. Depending on which enemies you slay, different factions will react accordingly. Hunting beasts? The Witch Coven will love that. Slay Ethereal Vanguard? The Black Legion will remember this. You can also undertake bounty quests for bonus reputation. The only downside here is once you select a bounty quest, you cannot abandon it. It has to be completed and will persist even on re-entering the game. Increased reputation of course unlocks more to buy from vendors, including consumables that permanently boost reputation gain, which I recommend you buy as soon as possible. Once you've maxed out a faction's rep, you can purchase mandates, even bigger rep boosts designed to be transferred to your other characters. This is game design that rewards your time and respects your time. Back to my soggy adventures, and now a choice. Bourbon wants me to proceed into Burwich Village proper. Everything I've been exploring thus far has been the outskirts, the old dumping ground and the prison, but the bridge is out. I can use some of my iron bits and scrap to repair it. I can choose to spend those resources or venture into the flooded passage down below, bypassing the bridge, but engaging in dangerous encounters. This is really neat game design for two reasons. Firstly, choice is always good, even if players end up doing the same thing every time. For example, I am the sort of player who will always repair the bridge and then dive straight in the passage. I'll do both, but giving me the option is nice. Secondly, there is a distinct cost to either choice. Repairing the bridge uses resources but saves time, effective for subsequent playthroughs, whereas taking the passage takes longer yet costs nothing and may yield rewards. The flooded passage isn't just some cave, it's the largest underground area yet, and while it's mostly filled with packs of regular enemies, it takes a good 12 minutes to explore the entire cave. I see a detonation site while I'm down there, indicating that I can come back later when I've got some explosives. I also learn there will be secrets to find in areas that aren't illustrated on the map. This area not only has a rift gate, but also another shrine to cleanse and an end boss that brings the cavern ceiling down on you. Once you do have dynamite, there are several detonation sites throughout the game. Some are required to progress and some are optional. Dynamite can also be used to blow open special treasure troves. You can even use dynamite to blow open access to an entirely new area with dungeons. Oh no, it's the barons. I've blown open the way to the barons. No wonder they blocked it off. Exploration is a massive part of Grim Dawn in one sense and not a part of it at all in another. If you want, you can go straight from A to B, hitting only the important bosses, speed running through the main quest, or you can explore every corner of the world, seeking out NPCs, hidden secrets, devotion shrines and quests. I'm exploring a side route on the way to Burwich and I get into a pretty tough but doable fight with the local cult. One of them drops a strange key to a strange door. Beyond that door is a dangerous area, where every mob in there has a buff like burning damage or swift. This one however on entering gives me the warning that a foe far beyond my power lies in wait here. I choose to ignore the warning and carry on. It's rough but I reach a really mean meteor summoning wizard and eventually with lots of evading, I beat him. I keep pushing on and it's then I realise that wasn't the cultist boss, that was the cultist doorman and I die repeatedly. 
I love that I'm not just locked out of this area. I have the option to go in and do it now. It would be a mistake, but another player might be better prepared, or let's be honest, just better at the game. And they could tackle it no problem. The worst part about this whole thing is that not once have I been offered to join the cult, because I am a big fan of cults. I come back here much later and the area has scaled with my level nicely. I'm much more powerful but I still have to be awake to do this. And what do I find in the cultist back rooms? Whoa, Death Knight gear baby, let's go. I want to emphasize that secrets aren't always just hidden chests. Some are whole areas and you should keep an eye out for covered rocky holes and crumbling walls. It's always a good sign when you find a hidden passage not on the map and the words ominous lair pop up on your screen. I love to see exploration feeling truly rewarding. After securing the village and working my way through the warden's very impressive underground facilities, I've come face to face with Warden Krieg, the final boss of Act 1. Compared to the reanimator, he's kind of a pushover. For real, this guy is less dangerous than some of the enemy packs leading up to him. It's tank and spank, and I'm thinking, I've got good gear now, I'm better prepared, but I'm still disappointed. Can't do that yet. Oh, oh, this guy was just getting warmed up. Now he slaps. The mechanics are solid and creative, making use of debuffs, area attacks, and slow but hard-hitting direct damage. His moves are telegraphed clearly by animations. Always good. There are some bosses that have moves that will not only deal damage, but inflict you with a vulnerability debuff, making every attack against you hit harder. I've only seen this on bosses, and there's an unmistakable sound when it hits you. This design encourages use of the evade skill, while penalizing you for being too slow without just straight up killing you. Grim Dawn has created challenge, dealt punishment, and yet still given you a chance to bring it back. The boss design in Grim Dawn is solid across the board, although some of the earlier bosses are clearly less complex in their design. My favorite boss is the Shaper of Flesh. When the Warden dies, he explodes in a shower of loot. So this is a good time to talk about loot and equipment, one of the cornerstones of an ARPG and Grim Dawn doesn't disappoint. Items come in various qualities, levels, and stats. There's a lot to go into here, so I'm gonna summarize for the sake of brevity. Qualities range from literal trash tier grey to cash money legendary perps. These can come with level requirements and level versions, as in there are some items you can't equip until you reach a certain level, and there are some items that come in higher level versions once you've reached a higher level. Stats vary from quality to quality and between items, but as a rule of thumb, yellow and green items tend to have randomised affixes that provide stats to equipment, while blue and purple items have no affixes. There are also double rare items that feature rare quality affixes at both ends. Okay, so what's an affix? Let's say you get an item that drops with the prefix impenetrable. That means that item will have pierce resistance on it, guaranteed. There's no getting in there. And the higher level that item, the higher the pierce resistance. Now, we're going to say that item also happens to have the suffix of nature's bounty. I'm making an item up for fun because I want to highlight that affixes come in different qualities too. We made this one up. The impenetrable affix is a magic tier stat, but nature's bounty is a rare quality stat. So okay, rare affixes are better than magic. Not a big deal, right? Not a chance. No, it is a big deal because what if the suffix was instead of kings? Of Kings features some other stats, of course, but also has a granted skill in the suffix. Battle Cry is a 20% chance when hit to cry out and embolden nearby allies. This means every yellow or green item not only has randomized stats, but a chance to give your character an entirely new skill. These are granted skills, another amazing part of Grim Dawn's loot system. Items can have skills attached to them either by design or randomly through affixes like we just talked about. When equipped, these will either add passives to your character or abilities to put on the hotbars. If you take the equipment off, you lose the skill. Some of these are abilities you can only get from items. This flash freezing frost nova is actually coming from my ring. That's some pretty cool jewelry. 
books that summon creatures, hats that call down meteors, there's even a pair of trousers that let you throw poo, of course there is. Certain items can also boost certain class skills, meaning you can hunt to get some class specific loot, mastery specific loot. The rewards for doing so mean boosting skills beyond their limitations. To rewind just a little bit and talk about higher quality, higher quality doesn't always mean better. This epic axe called Massacre is fucking awesome, don't get me wrong. But now I'm in act two, and this rare two-handed mace just dropped. The affixes look good and it's a straight damage boost, and this new mace has plus 4 to reaping strike. That's my primary attack boost. Massacre is looking a little last season, so I equipped the new mace. I definitely felt like I did more damage with the new mace despite it being a lower quality. Why did I rewind to talk about this? Well, while I was fighting these ghosts in a cave, the same item dropped again with two entirely different affixes not only giving it different stats, but also granting the skill Elemental Seal. A 20% chance on attack to plant a magic seal on the ground that deals damage. That's this blue seal seen here that's dealing steady damage over time to enemies within it. It's awesome that the same item can have such variety. Even better is that when something says on attack in this game, they're not fucking around. This seal doesn't just proc on my sword swings, it procs on every ability I have. This will even proc off my skeleton's attacks and the retaliation damage that hits when an enemy strikes me, meaning I can do literally nothing and still have seals for days. This level of interlinking combat systems means my blooded legendary scythe with a chance to doom bolt on attack will strike enemies with crimson lightning from the heavens just for looking in my general direction. If you haven't yet seen the appeal of this game. What's wrong with you? Grim Dawn encourages you to take new weapons for a spin, where I won't lie, in other ARPGs I basically just equip whatever looks better or sounds better. That is ultimately not the fault of those games, that's down to me as a player. What I am saying is this is the first time I'm looking beyond what just sounds better on paper. Grim Dawn has awakened in me that desire to experiment. I mean, I had my hopes. Let's not read into that too much. Bosses such as the Warden drop random items, but more importantly they drop items from a guaranteed loot table. These are called Monster in Frequence. These are items that are only dropped by bosses or a very specific set of creatures. For example, the Warden dropped his own mace and shield. How careless. Other bosses have their own loot tables and drop items specific to them. Haunted champions aren't bosses, but they are the only source of several spectral weapons. You won't find these on any other enemies in the game. Some bosses have their loot tables change or expand into higher difficulties. Components are very important. They are drops that can be applied to armor and weapons to give special buffs, resistance boosts, or even granted skills. You may be stressing out if you're seeing how fucking many I am carrying around without using any of them on normal. But believe me, this paid off in ultimate when I was ready for whatever the game could throw at me. You can also store components in your smuggler stash, even the shared tabs, and craft with them from there. So don't do what I did and only test this out after 80 hours. You can dump all your components in there at the press of a button. But what if your new shiny piece of gear doesn't fit your creepy Balenciaga aesthetic? What the fuck is this? All RPGs eventually suffer from the clown costume problem of mismatching gear. Perfectly safe illusions for a prize. Fortunately, at Devil's Crossing, you will find the Illusionist who will help you get out of your midlife crisis and back to looking your best. For a very minor fee, she can change any piece of gear to look like another piece of gear you've already looted. You don't have to keep that item on you. You can vendor it, throw it out the window, whatever. You've unlocked the appearance and that's good enough. This is very important to me, so I'm pleased it's in the game. The nicest thing about this is your unlocked appearances are shared across every character. Here I am on a brand new Arcanist and I can transmog every appearance my main picked up. There's also the smithing system. I can't stress that I'm trying to keep this script as concise as possible. I don't really enjoy the sound of my own voice. But there are more systems in this game than I can keep track of. Yes, you can collect recipes to make consumables, equipment pieces, relics, etc. You can find recipes or blueprints by slaying monsters out in the world, defeating bosses or totems, opening chests, or just buying them from a vendor, some of them gated behind reputation. The crafted equipment is neat, 
but not a feature I really found myself using, as I found far more loot than I could ever use. And I hope I can upset some people by browsing through my unsorted hoarder stash. Relics, however, do not drop from enemies that I can tell. They can only be crafted, so you have to find the blueprints for the one you want and then the rare reagents to have it made at the blacksmith. Then you can find blueprints to further upgrade it. This is such a good system and it's immensely satisfying to see a blueprint you've been hunting finally drop and any system where you upgrade old items gets a thumbs up from me. The master works all, you can't go wrong. Then there are emblems. These can be applied to medals and usually grant you special utility skills with a little more flavor than the standard components you can slap on weapons. I obtained this one after starting Forgotten Gods and it lets me leap about like a frog, which 70 hours in changed the way I navigate the game forever. Holy shit, this is fun. If you could be standing there, you can leap to it. And of course, once you have access to these, you can buy them, slap them in shared storage, and now your wizard bounces harder than a check written by an influencer. I only managed to get myself stuck on level geometry twice in the entire game. First, it was by accidentally leaping inside a staircase pillar, a place I was clearly not meant to be. The second was while fighting the final boss on Ultimate in Phase 3. Oh, you, you fucks. I was so close when this happened. While playing on Ultimate, I found a blueprint to craft a straight upgrade of this leap. The difference being more damage, a shorter cooldown and an additional bleeding effect while adding a level requirement of 50. More power for a higher level character. Good balance. Holy shit this one even fits my character aesthetic as my death knight comes crashing down in a splash of blood. Forgotten Gods adds some simple mobility emblems early on, but there are lots more available as blueprints, giving the player choices to pick thematic movement options that also benefit their build by making use of damage types is just genius. There is even an item called Stormrend, which I have been farming for my Oathkeeper Shaman. You see, Stormrend is very special. The Shaman's Lightning Calling Primal Strike is an ability that only works with two-handed weapons, unless you have Stormrend, a one-handed axe, which lets you just use Primal Strike and either a second weapon or a shield. This means I can live out my dream character of a lightning-wielding holy paladin who thinks they're a fidget spinner. I fucking love this game. Despite all the upgrades I obtained, all the blues that dropped, I couldn't bring myself to sell my salt bag, the initial starting amulet. There's a thematic weight to the item. Salt is used to ward off evil spirits, and it's regularly used in the game to keep ethereals at bay. While we're still talking about equipment and the topic of salt, there are 10 core damage resistances, and the lower your resistance is, the saltier you'll be. Fire, cold and lightning are your elemental resistances. What's nice about these three is you will often see them grouped on armor, so if something says it raises elemental resistance, it will buff all three. The next few are self-explanatory. Poison, Bleeding, Aether, Chaos and Vitality. These resistances all combat abilities or spells that deal their respective damage types, whether directly or over time. Next you have Piercing. This reduces damage from ranged attacks or blade attacks if they count as piercing. Stun resistance reduces the time you spend stunned. There are some additional resistances, but they're not as important as those core damage types. My favorite thing about this system is from what I can tell, you can use every one of these damage types against your enemies, and they have their own built-in resistances. Some minor spoilers for a boss fight. This guy called Faunosh the Unraveler was absolutely unraveling me. This was one of those rare instances where I was just getting one-shotted. The only resistance I really lacked at this point was Chaos Resistance. Well, wouldn't you know it, there's a lot of Chaos damage going on in this fight. After getting Chaos Bolted for a third time, I decided to try out the consumables on offer. I'd been collecting recipes while playing, and it seems that Bloodbound Ointment would increase my Chaos Resistance. I made myself some Honey Balm as well, as a treat. After I went back to Faunosh, I won't say it was a cakewalk, which is good because too easy is shit. It was just right. The honey helped boost my health a little and the ointment made sure I didn't get wrecked too hard. I still had a few close calls, but these were more oh shit moments, not oh time to go cry about damage numbers. Later on Ultimate, this Bloodlord was absolutely destroying me. This was the first time I really felt I couldn't win no matter what I did. So I stopped playing and thought about it. 
I was already buffing up with flasks, but I still had a weak link in my resistances. So, it was finally time to open up all those components I'd been hoarding and pop an unholy inscription on my gloves, getting my bleeding resist up to 61. It was still a little lower than I'd like, but I thought, fuck it. I can't really convey the tension I felt during this fight because on screen, it doesn't really look like much is happening. But it is. The boss summons whirlpools of blood, crimson waves, adds, he curses you, damages you over time. All of this is going on and with my build I'm relying on two things, cold damage and health regeneration. This is Grim Dawn in a nutshell. It's stressful until it's satisfying. And this is what the resistances are there for. To provide you damage reduction against the enemies you'll face without trivialising them. And the amount of different damage types adds a level of complexity to gearing and devotion planning without creating unnecessary bloat because all of these systems are interlinked seamlessly. And it's for this reason the Ugden Bog was a real wake up call because I was wondering why this place kept clapping me. What a fucking bozo. Ah, I see. Well, that makes sense because this place is more toxic than a League of Legends lobby chain poison explosions, toxic artillery plants, poisonous slams. Look at this fucking corridor, just look at it. It's so green it's giving me flashbacks to Legion. It's like Illidan Stormrage fucking jizzed everywhere. I can't get out of here fast enough. You are not prepared. And on harder difficulties you start with reduced resistances, meaning you have to work just that much harder to become resistant. I've put the link in the description to a guide written by Hayo on Steam showing all the components and augments that buff your resistances. But please don't look at that before you play because by now you might be thinking this is all too much and overwhelming. It isn't. The game is paced well enough that these systems grow relevant as the game progresses. You can just start playing and have fun without any real thought to gearing, level builds or whatever. Why else would I play on Veteran with no idea what the fuck I'm doing and just picking abilities that sound fun if not to see how accessible this game is for someone as average as me yet has the depth to cater to people who really want to go all out. With that being said, I'm finally going to talk about the Devotion system and I've waited this long because there's a lot to talk about. The Devotion system is essentially your talent tree but that is such an oversimplification in this case. It's here you can define your character even further with passive bonuses not tied to your mastery. Taking the points you've obtained by cleansing shrines, you can pick stars to invest in. Initially you'll only have access to the Crossroads constellation and picking one of these will give you a small buff and your first affinity point. There are five affinities and each of those will go up depending on what stars you choose to invest in. Taking this first Chaos Affinity star raises my Chaos Affinity which also unlocks a whole swath of new constellations. If I'd picked Order I would have unlocked Order Affinity stars etc. Some stars require higher affinity thresholds to unlock and as you've probably guessed completing constellations grants more affinity points and some constellations require a mix of affinities to be unlocked. I really want to get this Kraken because Squiddy Boy has big love for two handed weapons. It makes sense he's got eight grippers so that's four swords. The Kraken requires five primordial and five eldritch affinity to unlock so I first need to complete constellations that raise those affinities. To do this I decide to focus on unlocking the eel and then the scorpion constellation. When I unlock the final star in the latter I gain the scorpion sting ability. This is a celestial ability and the stars are full of them. They range from healing effects, summoning the blood of old gods or just a straight up whirlpool attack. And in the case of Scorpion Sting, it's an on attack chance to unleash poison spines similar to the arcane seal ability we had on an item. However, this celestial ability must be linked to a regular ability to function. I choose Cadence, the soldier's default attack. Now whenever I attack with Cadence, there's a chance to be toxic. You may have noticed Sting has an experience value. Celestial abilities rank up as you play, gathering power as you progress, which is just perfect. It encourages you to use your abilities, vary things up, but also gets the player invested in the devotion system early. 
Don't worry, I know this ability isn't great for me and I change it later. In fact, I make a whole new build halfway through playing because the game makes it that easy to respec. The game actually encourages you to respec points as it's possible to recover your startup costs, as it were, from the crossroads stars and put them into more useful constellations. This is thanks to the affinity system. As there are no hard talent tree lines to follow outside of each self-contained constellation, you can refund points and still keep constellations so long as you meet the required affinity. This is a system that has a clear progression, starting from zero affinity points and ending with however many you want. Low tier constellations lead on to high tier, multi affinity constellations. Yet it doesn't rely on tiered progression in the narrow sense. There are no talent tree lines to follow outside of each self contained constellation. It is designed with so much flexibility that respecking is actively encouraged in order to make the most of your devotion points. But you never have to do any of this. You can keep it as simple as you like or make it so ridiculously meta. It is one of the nicest character builders I've ever seen, and as game design goes, the constellation system is stellar. I really hate that man. I want to say here that I followed no build advice, no skill planners, nothing like that on any of these characters. Although there are lots of builds out there, it's important for me to be able to say in a review if I can go in and just play the game. But with all this praise, let me talk about what I didn't enjoy. I really despised boss fights with large amounts of ranged enemies. There are some fights where adds are spawned continuously, which I never enjoy, no matter the game. It's personal preference, but I think ad fights become bottle of the barrel very quickly. I would say Grim Dawn doesn't fall into this trap often, even though there are bosses that summon adds throughout. Only a handful of times throughout the entire game did I think, this is fucking stupid. Which, seeing as how there are dozens of bosses and hundreds of hero enemies, is impressive. But I have to say it, getting killed by the 10 ghosts with fucking crossbows, and not the giant bone monstrosity walking around this coliseum, is just not a fun feeling. Fuck monsters that heal other monsters with AoEs. I hate shit like this. Being rooted, that's having your ability to move taken away from you because you're rooted to the ground, just no. The game's primary method of surviving death outside of all the resistances and stats is the better part of Valor. So my character stands there in the fucking fire, just having to accept reality. Oh well, I can't move, guess I'll die. On the topic of hasty deaths, I want to say while playing Grim Dawn, I encountered very few instant deaths. Instant deaths are a mechanic I hate almost everywhere. Tomb Raider style instant deaths are fine. You know what I mean. Lara lands on spikes, Lara dies on spikes. But in an ARPG, it just feels very unsatisfying to be instantly destroyed. In Grim Dawn, 95% of what would be, oh I'm dead actually, moments, instead play out as, oh shit I'm gonna die, moments. These are far more satisfying and fun because you can actually react to what's happening, run away, regroup and heal. Instead of the frustration of having no idea what killed me and the run back to the boss, I instead have stress, adrenaline and a nice feeling that I cheated death. Some people may say this makes it easier. I would say not really, it just makes it less punishing and more fun. If you do die on any difficulty besides normal, bosses will have a fairly large portion of their health restored. This is the balance, there's a real punishment for failure. Let's talk about the difficulty settings, and I want to begin by saying that although I played on Veteran from the start, I temporarily switched Veteran off because I wanted to see the difference between Veteran and Normal. Okay, that's a lie, it was that fucking bone colossus in the Arcovian Colosseum who, yeah, summoned a shit ton of ghostly crossbowmen. I was salty, what can I say, but what better point than to see the difference between difficulties? And honestly, it was night and day. I've seen people recommend to just not play with veteran because it slows your progress down, but I'm not worried about that, I wanted the challenge first time around, so I switched veteran back on. You can't play elite or ultimate difficulties until you've completed the base game. That's up to act 4 on normal. But I recommend playing through the entire game, expansions included, on normal first for multiple reasons. Most of all, to familiarise yourself with the mechanics, level up and to unlock all the devotion shrines. Once you've unlocked these difficulties, you can start on the harder levels. The way Grim Dawn works is by having your character carry over from normal to elite to gain more devotion points. As in, you get one set of quest rewards, skills, attributes and devotion points from normal, and a second set from elite 
making your character even more powerful. There is a devotion point cap however of 55. This is to keep things balanced and means you don't have to go back to every single shrine if you'd rather not. You simply go to the main menu and change the difficulty setting from normal to elite and hit start game. I load back in front of old Jarvis the Hangman, once again suspicious of my intentions. This time understandably so, as my character has a glowing red scythe and is wearing ancient Corvan armour from Desert Sands. That sounds like when it comes to replayability, it means an awful lot of trudging back through the same game on normal just to prepare for ultimate. But what if you want to try new mastery combinations on ultimate without having to 100% normal again? Forgotten Gods has you covered with difficulty merits. Once you have unlocked high difficulties and at least started the Forgotten Gods expansion, you'll be able to purchase champion and savior merits from the cult supplier in the Conclave. These consumables not only unlock the higher difficulties, but unlock all rift gates on lower difficulties, as well as granting the bag space increases and the skill and attribute points from lower difficulty quests. Run on sentence. It's as simple as buying them on your main character, transferring them in the stash, and then using them on your newbie. I love this, because for me replayability would come more from different class builds than different difficulties. Once I've tackled ultimate, going back to do all of normal would be pretty underwhelming. This is a great way to work in an optional catch up system, so you can play ultimate and still have time to do your more dailies. What the fuck is that luck? I came here to record one joke. I didn't even play Shadowlands. Well, I mean, who, who did? But that also sounds like it renders the earlier difficulties pointless. No, not at all, because you may have skills and attributes, but you'll still be on a brand new level 1 character. And because gear has a level requirement, you might find it hard to just cheese it with hand-me-downs. So lower difficulties aren't entirely irrelevant if you find ultimate too hard to start with. You also have to remember the negative resistance the higher difficulties impose upon you, meaning you can probably kite that slow under tank, but poisonous rats will eat you for breakfast. The merits mean you haven't got to play runaround if you don't want to. This is a balance between replayability and a respect for the player's time that I approve of. You can also purchase potions of clarity from the Malmoth Resistance at Revered, which increase a character's experience gain by 100% for an hour. And of course you can transfer these via Smuggler Stash, so you can level up even faster on subsequent runs. Also, since the latest patch, almost all enemies scale to your level on Normal and Elite, meaning if you want to play on Normal forever, you'll still have some level of challenge. I want to highlight this in an age where games more and more force a playstyle on players. Grim Dawn does its very best to let you tailor your own experience for a new game by letting you pick the head start you give your new character. Because higher difficulties can highlight issues in a game, I wanted to at least tackle elite difficulty before putting my stamp on the review. I can tell you this, enemies hurt more, they have more health and you resist less. It is essentially a number change, and usually I hate that. If that's the only thing that makes elite and ultimate harder, I should be here complaining. But I just can't, because the addition of new loot and some secret new quests and NPCs, they took the path of making Elite a more rewarding experience through exploration and equipment. The greater challenge serving as an obstacle to not just reach the same end goal, but new goals and loot as well. I notice that you're granted access to Burwich Prison immediately. Also you can of course instantly repair the bridge if you have the materials. And then I had an idea. What if instead of going through the quests, I just go north? Go north and activate the devotion shrines, explore, get a couple more two-handed legendaries, and drive straight up to Krieg's house. Knock knock bitch, I of course have to go through the basement and transit station again. Finally the underground lab. I forgot how big Krieg's setup was down here. I'm a little jealous to be honest, part of me has always wanted a secret underground lab and tubes filled with specimens. I've sought help, but nobody wants to get in the tubes. Krieg is no match for a death knight who has walked through blistering sands and soggy sewer alike. I can go back to Bourbon and just let him list off what he wants me to do, and because Grim Dawn has been well designed I take delight in telling him the Warden is already dead. To which he simply says, Is that so? Care to elaborate? And my response is, I tracked him down and ended his life. Yeah, pretty on the nose. On the rocks is pleased and so am I.
I kept going up until Homestead, but honestly my character felt a bit too ready for Elite, so I just said fuck it and started Ultimate, and did the exact same thing again. Now we're talking, I'm stretched to the edge of my health bar all the damn time, most of my resistances are lower so I have to work just a bit harder to bump them up, still no get out of jail card for Krieg though. I want to be absolutely clear here, I'm not saying Elite is a pushover joke, nor am I trying to sound like some mega pro gamer because that isn't what's happening. That isn't happening at all. What I am saying is my character was leveled, geared and built to the point where Elite difficulty was not as hard as I expected. Meanwhile in Ultimate I'm getting clapped by a fucking wasp. Waspinator, happy at last. The difficulty in Grim Dawn is both scaling and fixed. Scaling in the sense that no matter what difficulty you're on, mobs level up to your level to remain challenging, but fixed in the sense that your resistances are so much lower on Ultimate and you need to plan around that. Even with 80% frost resistance, frost is hurting me on Ultimate. Elite and Ultimate are there for challenge, loot to hoard away in your stash and for the satisfaction of beating them. No problems here. Ultimate is quite literally the ultimate challenge and holy shit I cannot stress the boss fights are insanity on ultimate. They are nail biting, fun, adrenaline pounding, visual spectacles and non-stop pressure with in my opinion no bullshit mechanics. This is some great boss design. After a lengthy run across country and slaying a servant of the dying god Kafun, I head back to report my victory and the end of the base game. Seamlessly, Ashes of Malmoth kicks off as Captain Bourbon and a young woman make their way through the rift. Devil's Crossing has been attacked by a new type of ethereal monster and even worse, Bourbon's run out of whiskey. Fortunately we know where the monster came from. The burning city of Malmoth. Let's talk about the expansions and what you're getting for the game. Ashes of Malmoth adds two new acts and rounds out the story of the Ethereal Menace. Two new masteries, the Necromancer and the Inquisitor, new factions, constellations, hundreds of unique items and raises the level cap to 100. I loved wandering around the crumbling city of Malmoth, which I think is a perfect rendition of a Victorian-esque fantasy city. An absolute joy to play through with such a phenomenal end boss. Most importantly, the illusionist transmog service? That's in Ashes of Malmoth, and obviously the most important feature in the game. Ashes of Malmoth is in essence more of what is already there, but I don't mean that in a bad way, because it's excellent. You can't go wrong if you just want to reach goth milf tier. You'll have a truly solid ARPG adventure with an endpoint. But if you want to keep going even further into ripped paladad territory, Forgotten Gods will add a seventh act with a swath of side quests, a new mastery in the form of the Oathkeeper, new factions and an entirely new endgame mechanic. The Shattered Realm. Forgotten Gods also transports you to a whole other part of the world, so it truly is unlike anything you've seen before. Ah. We speak at last. After completing Ashes of Malmoth, I finally talk to the Emissary, no not that one, who has been following me around at quest hubs, who says there is a whole new problem happening far away. You don't get the weekend off in Cairn, and stepping through the portal strips the muddy environ of Devil's Crossing away, replacing it with warm, sun-kissed sands and dry ruins. Here my deeds are not yet known. These people know nothing of my incredible ability to hold down left mouse button and press 2 every 10 seconds. And so they sent me some eldritch trials to gauge my abilities. Kanafa, the mistress of the sentinels has some information about them. And I listen to every word she's saying. A forgotten god stirs. An ancient enemy of mankind threatens to destroy us all. Are you prepared to begin or not? Huh? Oh yeah, I'm ready. Do I start? Oh, just fucking launch dogs at me. Maybe I should have listened. I love how this undead has gilded pharaoh-like garbs and the dogs look weirdly twisted by eldritch magic. Oh I love Egypt so much. <laughs> it's not all sand though, there's stark basalt crags, you journey into an active volcano and an entirely new plane of existence. We're posed with a faction choice, we must choose a cult to join. Finally! I've been itching to join up since I saw the Kafan posters. Oh I love cults so much, we must pick one of three cults, each following a different witch god. This will determine which faction quests we pursue. Eventually you'll be able to gain the rewards from all of them. The cult of Bismiel is run by Basilla, the matron of rifts, who looks suspiciously like the necromancer from the Malmoth artwork. Dreeg's envoy has the aging rocker thing going on and speaks of foretelling the future. As a nice touch you can speak to someone gifted with this foresight and it's clearly driven them mad. 
and Sagon, the Vicar of Salile, a fruitcake who wants to do the right thing but also obtain power no matter how many people he sacrifices. The world is ripe with power for the taking, if you have the will to claim it. I'm not saying this guy isn't on my wavelength. We could be BFGFs, that's best forgotten God's friends. But. I'm shivering with anticipation for what's next. What can I say? She makes a convincing argument. I'll see you next playthrough, Sagon, I promise. I'll pick Salao as my next cult. We'll hang out and play Lethal Company. There's a fire exit. Oh! Salile has no time for distractions. Oh, don't be like that, dude. Come on, look, I gotta go. Basilla's quivering. Sagon, huh? More like Sagon D's nuts. Oh! Forgotten Gods also adds Garrus. Just like old times. He will take your iron bits in exchange for iron bars, items that you can stash away and, you guessed it, transfer it to your other characters via stash to be traded back in for iron bits. Simple and immersive currency transference. Besides the excellent seventh act, the biggest feature of Forgotten Gods is the Shattered Realm. Between these golden sphinxes, you'll enter portal after portal to strange, broken planes of existence. In here, you'll find exceptionally powerful items found nowhere else. As you go deeper, the realm becomes more dangerous. This is your infinite endgame dungeon. 73 crafted levels chosen at random and put into shards of three. After defeating the Guardians at the end of a shard, you'll be presented with a choice. Take the money or risk it all for the promise of greater booty, and all the perils that come with it. You're timed within the shards of the Shattered Realm. If you take too long, some of your loot will fade into the void, so get a move on while you're in there. You even fight a sand-breathing dinosaur, and I love dinosaurs. There's also the Crucible DLC. It's an arena, horde-type, wave-based thing. Not my cup of tea, but it's available and comes with the definitive edition of the game. The biggest thing I haven't talked about is that Grim Dawn features cooperative multiplayer, meaning you don't have to journey Cairn alone. You can venture with friends up to a party of four. I'm just saying, don't trust YouTube reviewers. They're full of shit. You literally are a YouTube reviewer. Shut the no, fuck no, up. No, 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 no. However, the game just flat out won't allow this if not everyone has the exact same expansion packs installed. This is a big problem and definitely counts against the game. You can get around this with Steam launch parameters or the GD Switcher, a tool made by Powdam on the Crate forums, making the whole process much simpler. I've used this tool myself to get playing with a vanilla friend and we had a good laugh. The GD Switcher even keeps your vanilla save separate so you don't risk screwing up your main saves. That's a weight off my mind. Thanks, Powdam. As for multiplayer, it's very fun and your mileage will vary depending on who you choose to bring with you. Let's go to the boss, right? Come on. Yeah, you're the one standing in the, in the building. I'm fucking waiting for you, man. I'm here. There are some balance concerns I've read online, but I don't really care about that. That's probably a poor take for a reviewer, but fuck it. Multiplayer in this game is here to play with each other, not against each other. Balance should give way to fun. And after a slightly rocky start, listen, click on single player. Okay. Ah, yes, that's where multiplayer is. It was clear what the highlight of the game was. No, look, look at this, look at this. See ya. <laughs> for fuck's sake! I need to say I experienced my first game crash in multiplayer and my friend had an instance of bug loot. These may indicate a slightly buggy multiplayer experience, but nothing that ruined our sesh, at least. The Double Force horse couldn't even path around a barricade on the fucking ground. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, well, look at this. Okay, yeah, that's a perfect segue into this final bit of gameplay. I do try and keep my reviews isolated, but in this instance, as the game is still receiving updates and will have an expansion pack coming out in the future, I'm going to talk about the competition here purely to inform paying customers on my opinion as someone who has played Grim Dawn and Path of Exile. If you like ARPGs, then for the money you get an immense amount of gameplay and a wonderful world to sink into. And if you're sitting there thinking, but Path of Exile is free, you're absolutely right. Path of Exile is excellent. I love it, go play it. But Grim Dawn's gameplay is different, also excellent, and moddable. Some dedicated modders have added masteries to cover Titan Quest classes, Diablo classes, and so many more. Crate Entertainment has a dedicated modding section in the official forums, and I love this, because it shows just how much they value the efforts of their player base. I'm trying to say you can have both these games sitting pretty at the top of the shelf. In my mind, these two games hold thrones next to each other for different reasons. Meanwhile, 
Diablo 4 features an in-game cash shop, a battle pass with premium skippable tiers and was created in such a way that you can't actually have sufficient storage for your characters. They made it so when another player is on the same world as you, you load everything they have. That's their full inventory, their entire stash, everything they own, what they've got in the back of the van, which obviously impacts performance. So to stop that bloating out, they limit your number of stash tabs. This sounds like a mistake that would be made if I programmed Diablo 4. Maybe my info is a little out of date, but this is hilariously bad when you pile it on top of all the other shit. Now, I don't want that last bit to cheapen the review of Grim Dawn, which shines like a fucking star on its own merits. But there was a purpose to that little rant, and that is to give a buyer's perspective, because Diablo 4 is 60 quid, with the proposed expansion possibly costing a hundred pounds at the time of writing. That is in insanity. I mean, Diablo 4 is trying to sell a horse for $65. I can't believe I'm saying this, but there's less value for money here than a Ubisoft game. Fucking scandalous. Grim Dawn's Definitive Edition, that's base game plus two expansions, is around £45 in legal tender of the Great British Empire. And I got it for nearly half that on sale. Yet Grim Dawn is the game I'd pay full price for. There's no competition. Demon Mommy is beaten by Necro Mommy, hands down. What about Last Epoch? Don't know, haven't played it. Looks promising. What about Titan Quest? Look, we can't be here all day. I just wanted to compare this eight-year-old game to its current day competitor and say how Grim Dawn still comes out as king. Oh, one last little quality test I have to perform. Okay, watch closely, now here goes. Did you see it? I pulled my ethernet cable out. And Grim Dawn doesn't give a shit. There is no always online here. You could play this game on a nuclear sub. There are cosmetic microtransactions for Grim Dawn. I'm not a massive fan of these. However, this is one of those rare occasions where I'm reasonably cool with it. These are purely cosmetic outfit packs, and while some are clearly better value for money, none feel essential. And the game features a huge variety of armor and weapon appearances. I have no doubt there were more than I could find through my entire playtime. So I'm reasonably cool with this. They are even called loyalist packs because these aren't made to milk new players. These are for fans who can't get enough and want to support development on future works. So why am I okay with Grim Dawn's microtransactions but not Diablo 4's? Well, Crate has released a total of three cosmetic DLCs over eight years. In eight months, Diablo 4 has an entire shop full. In Grim Dawn, one pack of 7 dollars is on average five pieces of armor, versus Diablo 4's one piece of armor for 25 quid. It's just fucking greed. It's just good business. Plain and simple. And I want to be clear, I'm not bashing players for buying microtransactions. Why would I do that? I'm criticizing the company not the customer. Saying that, I will disclose I don't own these cosmetic DLCs. However, what I will also disclose is that while making this review, I was dabbling in some other games, brand new releases that I was really enjoying my time with. And yet I found myself booting up Grim Dawn just because I was having so much fun. So I'm not unbiased, but I am trying to be reliable as far as my review goes. Grim Dawn is a phenomenal top-down ARPG with enough questing, zones, enemies and bosses to keep you busy forever. More uniques, both epic and legendary than I could ever find, despite my playtime, with so many systems and character building methods that you could lose yourself for hours crafting your perfect character. Or just pick what sounds really cool. Great boss design, good pacing for the most part, and one of the few games I've played that makes me want to go again. Gosh, am I done gushing already? No, I've barely begun. I'm sorry because we've got the story and characters to talk about now. This is a good time to refill that drink, or if you're Captain Bourbon, open another bottle. I think one of the biggest issues with top-down ARPGs is that the player may have no actual impact over the world outside of the funnel you're pushed through. That just doesn't feel like the case with Grim Dawn. And in ARPGs, it's rare to find that winning combination of a simple but solid story with detailed world building, small personal stories, and lore that pulls you in. Usually I talk more about the quality of the storytelling than the actual story, but for Grim Dawn, I'm going to discuss more elements of world building, side quests, and player impact with some examples. This will lean into considerable spoiler territory. The main story is simple enough. You're saved from possession and incidentally, the noose by Captain Bourbon, the leader of the Burwich prison survivors. They're doing their best to fend off ethereal invaders, but 
Appropriately enough, the noose is tightening. You owe him if you ever want to see some semblance of normalcy from within the prison's walls. A good hook to get your character out and fighting. Your possession by an ethereal is the perfect setup to explain your Riftgate powers and other heroic capabilities. Gradually the story shifts from helping a settlement to establishing a supply line. The storytelling is natural. This is a perfect way to send the player further afield as problems close to home are easing up. Once you reach Homestead, a new threat emerges, but also a new ally. You still have other problems to deal with, but this takes precedence, and the Black Legion needs all the help it can get. The story culminates in a climactic battle to save the world. As far as the base game goes, you save the world at least twice more after that. You might be thinking this sounds like a pretty simple narrative and you'd be completely right. Everything happens exactly how you'd expect it to go with a couple of minor exceptions. Yet this doesn't count against the narrative because despite being a straightforward narrative, it's handled well, with good pacing, and each new quest feels like a logical progression for the world of Cairn. You're not dispatched to beat the old god from the get-go. This isn't some sacred quest, it's more like you get up there and they see what you're capable of. I'll skip the pleasantries. Olgrim tells me you're one tough slith, and right now that's what I need most. Holy shit, this guy can walk the walk. Kind of a badass. He took care of those bugs eating our crops. Maybe he can take on the dead god from the black void between space and time. A logical progression. All the while, the narrative is supported by a small but strong group of characters who grow on you, and they helped keep me invested from start to finish. At one point in the main story, I'm asked to speak to representatives of two factions, both of them somewhat unorthodox orders. One a group of religious zealots, and the other a group of sussy necromancers. They both sound like my cup of tea, but I can only recruit one, as the two groups will refuse to work together. I chat to the necromancer for the Order of Death's Vigil, and he's chill. However, when I talk to the representative for Kaimon's Chosen, the religious zealots, he won't even let me ask my damn questions. He can smell the grim stench of death on me as a necromancer, and that's the end of that. This is great. I love when class choices affect narrative progression. So I talk to my buddy Haruv and go with the necromancers. He tells me about their sanctum up north. And in classic RPG fashion, to the north means two minutes up the road. Brother Moltair sulks. He's like, ooh, filth stands alongside filth. Fitting. Don't expect any mercy on the battlefield. This guy does not realise the shit he stirred. Oh, I hope I see him again. It's not all fighting back the forces of evil. Some of the quests are appropriately mundane for a post-apocalypse. The people of Cairn will request your help in just getting by. The first instance is restoring the water supply, but then it's time to address food concerns. They're starving in Berwich Prison, so you're asked to head north to Homestead to secure food. However, when you get there, you learn their farmers aren't just plagued by the Ethereals, but also the Cult of Cafon and an insect infestation. The Black Legion are capable fighters, but even they need a roof over their heads, and there is nothing left to salvage. But with access to a lumber mill, they would be able to secure some fresh material. So I guess I'll go clear out the lumber mill. These may sound like running about quests, but they're paced and set up in such a satisfying way. They fit the needs of the world, and so I enjoy doing them. You ever get that in a game when someone asks you to do something that the city guard should probably have done already? I have a favour to ask, give you the time to listen. It's just a matter of warding the village from crime. But they're stretched too thin, or whatever, because of a pickpocket epidemic. My cousin's out fighting petty thievery and drunken brawls, and what do I get? God duty. It doesn't happen in Grim Dawn, because when someone says they're undermanned or stretched too thin, they fucking mean it. They're barely holding things together, and so every time you restore a basic need or a semblance of life, you're helping a community that desperately needs extra hands. And the game gives you plenty of ways to impact the world outside of the main story funnel. I stumble upon a man pointing a gun at a woman's head. She's fearful for her life, and the man says to turn over some money, or he'll kill her. Now I'm no fool, I've seen a dozen tricks like this in New Vegas, but I figure I'll play ball. I fork over the money and he tells me to beat it. She, on the other hand, is a little regretful and admits it's a con. Now I could kill both of them for being major dicks, or forgive them and open up about the prison. I do the latter and they're both grateful. Later, I get a chance to talk to them and learn Helen was a companion at the Lusty Mare and Julius was a pickpocket. 
homeless and alone. The apocalypse had driven him to kill a man for a piece of bread, and you can tell he's ashamed for what he's had to do. He's not all bad though. He rescued Helen from a pack of goblins, or grobules as they're called in Cairn, and the two of them came up with the idea to extort people because, as they both said, the alternative was to join a gang and start killing people. I think this is what I love most about Grimdorn's little incidental stories. You can be an inch away from killing someone for mistaking them for an actual highwayman, or kill someone just because they tried to con you, but in both instances you're killing a man filled with regret and a woman just trying to survive. However, it was just as likely letting them into Devil's Crossing could have been a mistake. It's rare to see this level of storytelling in an ARPG, at least in my experience. There's no reward for this little adventure other than feeling good that you didn't open up on a cup just trying to get by. I do have some issues with the storytelling however. Remember the bug queen I killed to help the farmers of Homestead? Well after this you'd figure they'd have no problem sending food to Devil's Crossing, right? Not this time. Turns out they're holding on to me like a golden goose. Maybe you could take a look at my creaky door, says one man. I need someone to mix up a barrow of cement, says another. One woman says she can't get her washing machine to fill, maybe I could inspect her pipes. I agree to the last one, but at some point I think I've been taken on here. I've already killed the queen of the bugs, I've done my part, yet still they won't send food to old Barnabas. This was the first time in the game for me that something besides bounties and gear was gated behind reputation. I need to reach Honoured with Homestead in order to unlock another quest. Once you've done that, they agreed to help you. I know I talked about this earlier in the review, but let me explain further because I have mixed feelings about this. It isn't a main quest, you can completely ignore it and just power on through. It doesn't impede your gameplay in any way, but not doing this little rep grind would mean Devil's Crossing starves. I actually care about the people in Burwich Prison, so this is a quest thread I want to pursue. Reaching Respected is not the issue here, as farming is all part of the ARPG experience. I simply exit my session, load back in, and go back to the hive for a queening. Still not enough rep, but the boss has leveled up to match my new power level. Nice. In fact, I don't even get to reach her a second time before I reach respected reputation. That's good. I do the boss fight anyway, and look, I get this fantastic insect-themed shield. I'll chat about armor appearances later, but I want to mention it early because I love stuff like this. Items themed around the bosses that drop them are highlights of any game. Once I've reached Respected, I can take bounties, and I do a few. And they're neat, I appreciate the endgame content. However, I decide to pursue the main quest, and thanks to the good reputation system, I reach honor just by killing beasts out in the fucking Ugdenbog, when nobody from Homestead will ever benefit from what I'm doing. Guess I'm just honored to be here. But once I've reached Honoured and completed the quest to get food to Devil's Crossing, there's no real satisfying payoff, I just get a reputation boost. We've already received a shipment of food from Homestead and more seems to be on the way. And unlike the water supply or the fabric quest, there's no visual change to show that they're eating better. This is such a shame given the way the prison develops when you do the little side quests to save people and bring them resources. I would have loved to see an indication at both camps that they were working together, even if it was a horse and cart just waiting to unload. There's another instance like this where two absolute fucking brats of children are being mean in the resistance camp. No, I'm not exaggerating, one of them is at Joffrey levels of prick, and the dialogue choices for the player just... Oh, bless you crate for letting me go all the way up to, I could rip out your bones and reanimate them. Down to the far more sinister, oh, your dad gonna tear me a new one? Not here now though, is he? Not fucking here, is he, fad? I enjoyed all of that far too much, but then I meet Evelyn and she wants to be a necromancer, and there's a lovely but sad story she has to tell. She also tells me those prick kids are bullying her. Right. I'll sort this out, kindred spirits gotta stick together. I go to Fad and the other piss ant and say back off, leave Evelyn alone or I will destroy you and your dad. They take the hint. But when I return to Evelyn, she's forgotten our entire conversation. I just stood up to those two children all by myself and you can't even acknowledge me. I don't even know who you are. These are very minor complaints and these moments are scarce. I really had to dig hard into Grim Dawn to find points to complain about, you understand. Otherwise this just sounds like a puff piece, and Harry hates puff pieces. But pretty soon you want some meat and potatoes. You do? I will also say that Ashes of Malmuth and Forgotten Gods add their own narrative threads. Ashes is a satisfying, climactic conclusion to the base game with returning characters being further fleshed out, as well as new groups and people to deal with. 
Forgotten God's story is different in tone and pacing, but no less enjoyable. It feels shorter, and I was less invested in the fate of the world shit, I won't lie. But the characters got a lot more chance to shine in this case, and I feel that balances it out. All of the main characters are good, and waste very little time with backstories which is refreshing, and suits a world that has to look forward. There's an appropriately serious tone to most of them, because the stakes are so dire. Olgrim has a bit of a jokester side to him, but it never feels out of place. Well, if it isn't my old friend from Devil's Crossing. There's tensions between some characters to help make the world feel more real. Even if everything has gone to shit, not everyone can put the past behind them. Good, you've arrived. Things here are in worse shape than I thought. Inquisitor Creed and Olgrim are of course highlights, along with Barnabas and Bourbon. But the smaller players like Captain Soma are good too. All the Black Legion NPCs felt like hardened veterans. Basilla, of course, I love, but also the Emissary who was almost omniscient in the story. An instance of a character where if his stories are true, he has more impact than the player character ever could, and yet had no impact without the player. I even warmed up to Sagan. <laughs> The dialogue can get wordy at times in the sense you get it all dumped on you at once, but understand this isn't a game where you're getting dialogue all the time. That's not a complaint, that's the sort of game it is. But it was good enough that I was left wanting more, and I read every word. When there was voice acting, I listened to it all. More on voice work later though. For now, I just want to say the characters are more than simple quest givers, but never bog you down with erroneous details. They can be funny, remorseful, petty, but they're all, for the most part, trying to do what's right. And the dialogue does more than push the story forward, it provides flavour, meaning and weight to what's going on. Some of it's downright inspiring. I'm going to talk about the very strong world building for a bit. While wandering about the Arcovian foothills, I see something that doesn't quite belong. Up until now, the aesthetic of Grim Dawn has had a recurring theme. Beautifully detailed, but limited to the grim rural Victorian look. Rotting junkyards, forests and fields, home to ruined farmhouses and the occasional upper class home. These ruins are unlike anything else we've seen, and for now, they're just peppered in this one corner of the zone. Just enough to hint that there's more to the world. I find a journal entry. From reading it, it's clearly the work of an academic, and his last thoughts as the apocalypse begins to set in. He remarks how society is collapsing just as it did before for the ancient Arcovian Empire. The foothills aren't just named something random, then named that because this was once part of the Arcovian Empire. I learned that the ghosts and the haunted champions I was fighting earlier, these are the nobles and honoured warriors of Arcovia. For now, all we know of them are these surface level ruins and that the Empire fell. This is a wonderful way to lead us towards future lore developments by laying the foundation for world building early and not oversaturating the player with information. Later I get the full story from Umkala, who talks me through the fall of the Empire, how necromancy and the lure of immortality and infighting led to their downfall. What do I find at the bottom of a mine in an old dig site right next to a shrine? The Annals of Arcovia. This starts a quest to return this ancient text to, of course, Amkala. She's very pleased. This may all seem like an insignificant thread, but I love this. World building, tied into discovery, talking to NPCs, and then exploration? There's no quest here to go uncover the secrets of Arcovia. You just do it through natural adventure, as the shrine encourages the player to go down there and explore. After killing Warden Krieg, I find a letter from a suspicious individual apologising for using such a corporeal method of communication. They're too far away to talk using their minds, and although the world of Kern has mad science, there's obviously no reception here. It's clear this is another ethereal possessing a human body somewhere far away. In the letter, he shows concern that Krieg is going above and beyond his purpose for being there. It seems initially, Krieg fully intended to experiment simply on the already dead. But now, Krieg has begun torturing humans. The ethereal in the letter implies that the corporeal body has corrupted the ethereal with its own petty personality. As in, although Warden Creek is being possessed by an ethereal, Warden Creek himself is warping the ethereal with his dark personality traits. The nature of the ethereal possession is explored upon further in Ashes of Malmoth, and it's such a wonderful twist on the classic possession idea. 
I love stories about possession or two minds inhabiting one body. It's a hallmark of science fiction. Body swapping on Farscape, that's always a classic. Come on, man, I'm... They're here. They're right here. Soul magnets on Fringe, where they consider putting a deceased scientist into a cow. And on Star Trek, someone got possessed every night of the fucking week. The parasitic Ga'uld of Stargate are a personal favourite, taking complete control over the host body, acting as gods and forcing them to watch as they do all manner of horrific things to innocent people. They were monsters, but you know what? They knew how to make an interstellar empire look good. You played it in gold, baby. Disgusting decoration. And this relates to Grim Dawn because previous hosts of Ga'uld symbiotes can still make use of their technology after the parasite leaves their body, just like your character has access to incredible powers after being possessed by the ethereal. Man, I fucking miss Stargate. And Farscape. And Fringe. And unless it's Picard Season 3, we don't talk about new Star Trek. If we don't talk about it, it can't hurt us. An unmitigated disaster. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, possession. At first I was worried that your own possession wouldn't be revisited, but that isn't the case. And it resurfaces in a satisfying way, and we meet plenty of other possessed threats along the journey. I find a little fishing town and get a frosty reception from a man there who tells me to move along. But a woman is more receptive, explaining they are being forced to work by Cronley's gang. When the villagers don't meet their quota, Cronley's gang have taken away their children. Quark would be absolutely horrified by this. Those children are idle labourers who could be put back to work to not only meet, but exceed that quota. That's seven employees. Eight if you count the infant. How can you shall be failing? You're not paying them, are you? Despite not following the rules of acquisition, I offer to take them all to Devil's Crossing via Rift. But she refuses, and explains that the children being held hostage will pay the price if they flee. This is good. The game acknowledges it has a narrative mechanic to send anyone, anywhere to safety, and then provides a feasible reason why it can't be used. Alicia says the best way to help would be to help the town meet their quota. And so I say I'll go have a word with Silas. And as a wonderful little touch, after accepting this quest, Oscar apologises for being so rude to me and is grateful I'm here to help. Now I have options. I can give Silas my five scrap and complete the quest, or I can bribe him with iron to piss off. I can also just fight him, but something tells me Grim Dawn isn't the sort of universe where I'm the ever-present, perfect timing hero of the realm. Fortunately, just walking away is an option, and I take that because I know my main quest is to kill Cronley himself. So I do that, and then I come back. Silas shits himself and runs off, consequence free. And Alicia is very pleased. This is good quest design. It offers me immediate choices that result in immediate rewards or consequences. Or I can just wait and see what happens. The story does feature some dark elements, however most of the really dark stuff is in the notes. So if you're bothered by particularly grim topics, no pun intended, you'll be fine waltzing through the main quest. Exploring aspects of the side quests is a different matter. But fret not, gentle traveller, some of the world is just downright friendly and bright, such as the safe haven of Barrowholm. Welcome to Barrowholm, traveller. Tell me, shall we be friends? The lore of the world is fleshed out by countless lore notes you can find, all with their own stories to tell. They range from journal entries, historical documents, correspondence. Some are predictably the last scrawlings of a life left for others as a warning or a monument. My favourite lore entry in the entire game is the excerpt from Dahlia's diary. She writes how her husband disapproves of her writing as there's work to be done on the farm, so Dahlia writes at night in secret, stating, he cannot stop the muse that pulls the strings of my heart. Later, you can return the diary to Dahlia. I'm pleased to say this character returns in Malmoth and Forgotten Gods, but this little part of Grim Dawn hit me. Part of why I make these videos is because I enjoy writing. I am that guy with an unpublished original sci-fi novel, and it is awful. Writing to create other worlds and adventures is still something I do just for fun, and sure, some of it isn't so tasteful. My point being I was touched by Dayla's story, and I was personally impressed with the surprisingly good writing in the game. The problems that the denizens of Cairn face range from otherworldly to mundane, and so do their aspirations. Some crave immortality and power, some simply want to put pen to paper. 
I do have a complaint that bleeds into the gameplay. Where narrative pacing is concerned, Act 4 is hit and miss. Weirdly, it feels like both a slog and a sprint. Yeah, I, I know, bear with me. It's a sprint in the sense that going from the start of Act 4 to the end takes a few hours and that's with side quests. This isn't including the outcast quests, but still, it's the shortest of the base game acts. However, it's spread across several large areas that just don't feel as fleshed out as the earlier zones. They're very linear in direction, and it takes a long time to cross them. If you just look at the world map, you can see the difference in everything past the Darkvale Gate. It becomes one long chain. I want to be clear, it's not bad, and I think it's meant to feel like the final push to stop the Cult of Kafon. Took you long enough. Then I thought I'd have to save the world all by myself. Unfortunately, the vast distance without any quest text or dialogue can make it feel like a slog even though it's the fastest part of the game. If you don't care about action being broken up by NPCs and questing, you will not have an issue with Act 4. But one of the biggest draws of Grimdawn for me is that I cared about the story, and it pulled me in. Act 4 lost me for a while, but pulled me back with a satisfying finale. The highlight of Grimdawn's narrative is that you don't just feel like a grand hero, you feel like a hero. You help the people of the world. For all the horror, for all the bloodshed, hope is the one thread running throughout the story. For the most part, the inhabitants of Cairn aren't evil, frothing at the mouth villains. They're people, scared, maybe trying to do the right thing, maybe doing the wrong thing to get by. You can aid almost everyone you meet, and it's through these little acts that you become attached to the world, and by the grand acts that you mark your milestones. Despite the fanfare of dispatching minions of the old gods or ethereals, the biggest story points, I think, are the smallest ones. Let's move on to the sound and music. The score of Grim Dawn was composed by Steve Pardo and Chris Wilson, who also provided some additional voices for the base game. There's a mood to the music that I would describe as Victorian Western Apocalypse, which sounds very much like it would be an awful mess of too much, but it's not. It's as perfect a blend as the setting itself. The zone tracks are generally ominous, allowing you to sink into that feeling of a ruined world, a rotten pasture, or a foreboding forest. Regular gameplay doesn't have its own combat music, so you won't have fast-paced action interrupt your general monster slaying and exploration. They save that for the boss fights, and when they kick in, they really kick in. They're all adrenaline fueled and fit the theme of the boss you're facing. Theme is a very important running thread throughout Grim Dawn's design, and it's one of my favourite things to see in a game. I want to go back to zone tracks because each and every one fits the zone it's playing in highlighting the visual and narrative themes present in that area, while also keeping the intrinsic feel of the game's post-apocalyptic setting. Let me just play a few samples. You hear these tracks and you're instantly transported to a dry and exotic fantasy world where sphinxes keep watch over forgotten ruins. Or you're back in the barrens, the tribal drums reminding you that this once tamed wilderness is now ruled by grobule tribes and briar beasts. Or maybe the music makes you question whether all this is really worth fighting over. Maybe it's better to just give in. Give in. And Every game has a standout track, and it's often different for everyone. For Grim Dawn, my favourite track came from the sewers, Lonely Moon. It capitalises on the Victorian-esque themes of the setting by bringing in a heavy serving of piano, yet it stays true to the sound that makes this game feel the way it does. It's melancholy, moving, but hopeful. I didn't just stop to write this paragraph when I heard it, I stopped to listen. Now where sound is concerned, I want to point out a little issue, sound balancing. I may be wrong, but I think enemy voice lines are tied to sound effects and not dialogue, because they're so quiet versus regular quest dialogue that it's very difficult to make out what's being said. I'm always on the campaign trail for individual volume sliders for everything, but I will forgive Grim Dawn because it came out in 2016. An acceptable sin, you just have to strain a little to hear what that cultist was chanting. 
Now that's out of the way, I want to say all the enemy sounds are great. That skill's not ready. With humanoids exhibiting a big range of noises, from the grunts of Cronley's fugs to the hiss of the slift. That skill's not ready. The real highlights of the sound design are your own abilities. They all sound so powerful, weighty, and satisfying to use. The thwack of cadence never gets old. The crack of thunder. The wave of bones. It's very important to have audio and visual feedback for your actions, and Grimdawn succeeds totally in this regard. The ambient sound in Grim Dawn, while easily overridden by the clash of combat and the game's soundtrack, shouldn't be overlooked, because it's wonderful. All of these sounds will transport you to another place, beneath the shade of a desert palm. The windy chill of the highlands. Or a place where man was never meant to tread. to find my apprentice. The voice acting is charming, and you definitely feel some voices are more comfortable in the roles from the very beginning. However, that settles relatively quickly, and before long I can honestly say I was impressed with the quality of the voice work. Almost everyone you meet is just a regular person trying to get by, and the more natural voice work plays into this nicely. But the characters in authority sound appropriately in charge and capable. The people you'd want to sound larger than life do so. The witches have their own tones and play into different witch archetypes. You have the cold, suspicious witch, and the classic, cackling matron. As usual with RPGs, there's too many actors to name here, but I will highlight my favourite. I know you'll miss me out there all alone, but we all have a part to play in this battle. Olgrim is one of the characters I recall hearing the most, and Kent Clark does a good job of voicing the mysterious figure. Like I said earlier, there's a bit of a gung-ho attitude to the well-spoken assassin, and he conveys it well. Mark Lucas is fantastic as Bourbon. There's just something about his voice that really sells the soldier-turned-community leader. He must have done quite a service with the dead if he's got hands to spare for old Barnabas. Let's get to business, yeah? Mark Dodson brings a lot of life to Barnabas. He's a very early character, but I just think he knocked it out of the park. He also voices the final boss of Malmuth, which, when you compare the two characters, speaks of his vocal range. The voice acting in Forgotten Gods is all fantastic. Every single actor knocks it out of the park. What a wonderfully thoughtful gift you've brought me. Heather Masters becomes Bacilla, weaving her words like an alluring web. Richard Reed as the wise emissary, he conveys the weight of his words perfectly. Yeah, yeah, Sargon, pretty fucking badass too. Lovely work by Chris Sharps. But Michael Dobson steals the show as Inquisitor Creed. He is absolutely fantastic and nails the role. A nation that scorned them as criminals, outcasts, and even traitors. In death, they were none of those things. Ringing with conviction and judgement, yet also the capability and the heart to be more than an Inquisitor, to be a real leader for humanity. All of that is captured in the excellent combination of great writing and great voice acting. You're gonna think I'm joking, but his speech at the finale of Act 6 is better than any legendary loot they could have given me. Malmoth is a great victory for mankind. It will become a symbol of our resilience. I remember sitting up straighter to listen. Between Lonely Moon and Creed, Ashes of Malmoth just knocks it out of the park thematically. Michael Dobson also played a few different roles in the X-Files, including a prominent role in Jose Chung's From Outer Space, one of the more well-known episodes. Our orders are to escort him back to the base. Well, the Major is dead. His body's being detained for further investigation. Investigation into what, ma'am? And he was a Jafar in Stargate. See how I brought that all round in a big circle from the Stargate rant? I know what I'm doing. It's definitely not me finding out later and pretending I knew from the start. 
The voice acting for Grim Dawn is solid, and while it takes a moment to warm up, and not every character is voiced, the ones that are sound good. They speak with character, with depth, and they bring you into the narrative with magnetic pull. I think graphics are a really boring thing to judge a game on, so I'm doing visuals and spectacle, and that's how dazzling and interesting it is to me within the style of the game. The aesthetics are wonderful, there's something about the art style that takes itself seriously enough to look dark, but colourful enough to be fun. The colours aren't muted, the models have character, there is enough vibrancy to balance the mundane. They fell into none of the traps of making a lacklustre grim world. The areas you move through are all absolutely gorgeous, from the nasty scrap heap and ruined villages, through beautiful forests, dusty ruins, leading towards windy pines, blown out cities, cities that once lived, and cities built for the dead. Wonderful areas bursting with flora and dotted with spectres of the past. The bleak, black and red fog of the void realms. The low mists of Astakhan rolling through your feet. The deep and dark caverns with luminescent fungi. There is as much wonder and beauty in the world of Cairn as there is the grotesque and the horrible. Grim Dawn makes all of it easy on the eyes. Every area is rich and detailed. Some areas may look sparse in my gameplay, but you have to remember, I've probably just smashed half the furniture in there killing monsters. What a great way to show the player's progress visually. A lot of incidental environment pieces are destructible. Not just furniture, but fences, stonework, etc. And I appreciate that a lot. Finally, when you're ready to accept the Emissary's offer and step through the portal to Corvan, you're greeted by bright, sun-kissed sands. Gone are the damp bogs and lively forests. The environment is wholly different, and we see an entirely different culture present in this far-flung corner of the world. The variation here is welcome after trotting around the verdant hills and fields. There's always a connecting path between zones, and I don't mean a load screen. This game has so few loading screens it puts others to shame. On the overland, there are often obstacles barring you from progressing through an obvious road or path, so you have to go around. It creates explorative gameplay, but more than that, the road is still there. Or the track marks in the underground tunnels, the broken bridges. There's always a visual indicator that at one point people travelled the road, but now something has blocked the path. Or it's otherwise just an indication of where you're headed next. One of my favourite parts of this visual design is being able to spot glowing blue mushrooms further down at the bottom of this cave. Soon after, you go further down there from another passage. That is great foreshadowing. While enemies do get decapitated and explode in blood and gore, visually the game doesn't rely on blood and gore to build up the horrors of Ken. Although the Cult of Kafon makes use of a lot of red, it's thematically tied to the cult. They knew they didn't need to make this a revolting gore fest because horror comes not from gross oversaturation, but from sharp injections and slow build-ups. The Blood Grove, for example, is not some horrible blood-laden ick fest. It's a gorgeous zone filled with autumnal trees. Every now and then you see the work of the cult, visually cutting up the natural beauty. Slowly you work your way through to the town and start to see more activity, until finally you're shown the stark interior of the bathhouse. They were saving that blood for this. It's shocking within the confines of the game. I respect the restraint and timing, and although Grim Dawn isn't a horror game, I love how they've made use of the horror visuals in the game. Great job guys. Been sitting on that one. I want to gush about the beauty of Malmoth for a moment. I am a massive fan of fantasy and sci-fi set in the Victorian era. There's something about the red brick, the style of the advertisements and shop boards, the cobbled street and gaslit lamps. There's an element of style here I just love. I'm already biased towards this era. The effects are so vivid and colourful, with every ability having some sort of visual feedback. This Aether fire looks so good, but also regular fire, the lightning and frost effects, the smash of your force wave pommeling, the skulls that rise from the bone harvest. There was never a moment I thought that looks bad or too much when watching a spell effect. Sometimes they could stack to become a little too much visually, but I'll forgive that as it's a problem not limited to ARPGs. Even the visual effects on your character that I usually hate, I loved here with little cold souls spiralling my death knight. And if you ever get sick of those visual auras, just turn them off in the options menu. Fucking thank you crate, put this in every game, fucking do it. 
The character and enemy models are so good that I want to try and show as many close-ups as I can, because remember, you're up in space looking down the whole time. They could have stopped at an adequate level of detail with these creatures, but they went all out. You see hordes of enemies, but there's enough variation in them so they feel like a horde of various foes coming to kill you. Not like copy-paste spam. Of course, a lot of the creatures tend towards more similar appearances, but even then there are usually different variations. You could argue that the most important visual aspect of an ARPG is enemy design. You're made to wade through countless numbers of them in fast succession after all. Every enemy, every boss, all of them look good, detailed and absolutely at home in the world of Ken. Look at this good boy, look at this chonker, even the animation makes me smile. And while I'm talking about animation work, everything is well animated, especially the character attacks and abilities, combined with wonderful and numerous spell effects for everything. Bright fireballs, explosive poisonous bursts, Bloodthirsty suck auras, fantastic. The lighting is just gorgeous. It really is, look at that purple. While the base game and Ashes have fantastic enemies in the Ethereals and their undead experiments, and the cultists of Kafon and their demonic summons, the Forgotten Gods expansion is a complete shift in enemy design. Gilded liches, mummified dogs, hostile griffins. Armor and weapon models are impressive and perfectly fit the lore of the world. You start with scrap weapons and armor, things cobbled together from the remains of yesterday. They start to incorporate old uniforms and regimental gear, along with more preserved pieces of equipment. Then the gear of your foes starts to drop, ethereal touched pieces that glow with that beautiful cyan. The red and diverse occult armaments of the cultists. Pieces salvaged from creatures like chitinous shields from giant bug queens. Hell, the corvan scarabs drop their own shells as shields. And for some reason, I collected them. I didn't do this for anything else, I just think they're neat. Whether it's the ghostly armaments of the dead themselves, or the horns of the feral bog creatures, the equipment often suits the enemies they drop from. Finally, you start to get artifacts that look as powerful as they feel. The big perps. But Grim Dawn's strength is that they don't save the effort for these rare pieces. They put as much work into every single piece. There's even a mace that is just a skeletal arm giving you the middle finger. It's hard to voice just how much I like the visuals, right down to the colour palette. The most important thing is that you never get bored visually. There are never great big vast expanses of muted colours. If there are areas mostly existing of one colour, such as the crop fields, there is always something eye-catching or stark to create a visually pleasing break. I remember thinking, oh great, a swamp, I hate swamps. But you know what, the swamp looked good. Good use of the statues as visual breakers, the highlights in these areas serve to keep you interested. Grim Dawn also has the inevitable sewer level, and even that looks great. I'm not saying it looks like a fun place to be, but you know, I don't hate it. I can't think of higher praise for the visuals than saying the sewer look good. Okay, it's summary time, and I'm wrapping up, starting with the negatives, because I want to end on a positive note. I think my biggest gripe with the whole experience was how levelling felt past level 60. It was a tad too slow for my tastes. However, the levelling curve up until 60 was perfect. This is of course just personal taste, and not a flaw with the game. Pathfinding when holding down your mouse over multiple levels can confuse your character, but again, minor complaint. However, Mouse pathing over NPCs while in combat should not trigger a conversation. This is awful. Okay, bad over, onto the good. Grim Dawn is a solid ARPG with an immense range of character development choices. Multi-classing, deep talent system, boundless equipment, a good if simple main story that hooks you in with smaller, more personal stories. Lovely world building, gorgeous world, with brilliant sounds, sights and creatures. Addictive gameplay that keeps you playing even when you're salty. It's just got to be one of, if not the best, top-down ARPGs I've ever played. I love it. I really do. And I'm excited for Astacon. So, can I recommend Grim Dawn? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, the runtime should have told you that. There are other brand new games I really wanted to play and I found myself instead booting up Grim Dawn just for fun. 
just to farm some totems or to level another character. I love this game and I want to see this world persist and continue. I hope it does. This isn't a game that was made on a conveyor belt. It wasn't injection molded. It was hammered by hand with heart. It is the antithesis of modern gaming and it is glorious without feeling dated, old or out of place. I think the nicest thing about Grim Dawn, about all the games I've been lucky enough to review, is how soulful they feel. This is a game with such a dark, dire world, yet there's a handful of pop culture references, daft jokes, shields that you can wield as a mace. This was a game made to have fun. Today we sort of view product as a dirty word. Movies, books and games are art, so to call them a product is a bit revolting, right? Not really, and I think we've been trained to think like that. A product is something you buy, you own, you enjoy. A service is something you pay for, but it's an arrangement. To keep enjoying the service, you may have to keep paying. The service may change, become more expensive, or disappear altogether. And let's be real, games as services are usually fucking shit. Crate aren't selling a service here. They're providing a product. It just so happens to be an immensely beautiful love letter to the action role-playing game genre. This isn't quadruple A bullshit, this is S-tier gaming. And from just one expression, we all instantly know what Leon's thinking. Long time no see. Ada. Leon, you have to find some way to get inside. Help me, 